Some of the most difficult times that we have in our lives come in the wake of a loved one's death. So many emotions, the sense of uh, finality, the soul-searching questions about our own mortality, all of that happens at once. And that's the condition that we most frequently hear, this passage from John. Um, it's part of the funeral liturgy. The preacher begins reading, Do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's room, house there are many rooms. Where I am there you will be also. Um, in that moment, our thoughts are so centered on uh obviously death and the promise of life after death, that we tend to um, put these pieces of this scripture together kind of like a formula. We might hear Jesus saying, um, don't let your hearts be troubled because when you die and go to heaven, you'll be in my father's house and, you know, there's a house for you there and your loved ones will be there joining you and you will be together with me forever. What a comforting image it absolutely is in the face of death. Although we Christians can get a little bit, uh, I don't know, crass or insensitive sometimes as we think, kind of simplify that piece together. Uh, our friend is uh, trying to help them cheer up because they're grieving and we might uh, you know, comfort, scold them saying, hey, don't be sad. That's our interpretation of don't let your hearts be troubled. Because your friend is in a much better place. Well, yes, we are God's children, and our eternal life is secure in God, and that is one of the wonderful gifts of God's grace. But this passage is more than just that, and God's grace is more than just one thing. And Jesus isn't sharing simply a keep-your-chin-up kind of platitude in the face of death. Although the promise in Jesus' resurrection is absolutely the best news in that circumstance. This passage is part of a bigger story. Jesus is guiding his disciples through a very difficult time. And so it is a guide for us today. Now the setting is in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples have gathered for their last meal together. In John's account, they have already uh, experienced Jesus washing their feet. They've eaten together and Judas has mysteriously dis disappeared. Uh, but now Jesus is telling his dearest friends that he is about to go away. And perhaps maybe for the very first time, they realize that he's talking about his death. This is the end of the way that things have been. These disciples are feeling as if there is nothing that they can hold on to. And Peter, he vows to give his life defending Jesus, only to discover that instead he's going to deny Jesus three times before morning gets here. And like the final straw, the disciples can't even do the job that the disciples are supposed to do, the one thing, which is to follow their rabbi wherever he goes. So they are vulnerable, and they have absolutely no idea what to do next. And we've been dealing with similar feelings for these last couple of months. We don't like to think about it, but amid all of these changes we're encountering, we're losing some of the methods, the things of how we do what we do kind of things. I mean, they're simple. They're the familiar things that help us navigate much of our lives without having to think about them much, which makes them so important and which makes us anxious in the thought of not having them. Little things like, for instance, will we shake hands again? Will you take the neighbor's kids to school in a carpool? What about buffets? Are they a thing of the past? Who knows? And that's exactly the point. Who knows? Uncertainty is troubling. We might be thinking about how do we get back to the way that we were, back to normal. But the reality of all this change around us is sinking in, and we realize that there is no going back. There's only going forward into a new normal. And this is unsettling to go into the unknown without the comfort of our familiar trappings and practices. Our old bag of tricks won't get it this time. Uh, think about how silly our old friend Bravado looks at this time. R remember, Peter, I'll give my life for you, Jesus. Let's go get him. That strategy didn't work. Because when we're afraid, I know our egos, they itch for a fight. 
Yet no matter how hard we try to find validation for that approach in the Bible, we always discover that relying on our own courage, our ego, our struggle for control, all of that ends in brokenness, in destruction, and in failure, which only God can and thankfully does mend. But the lesson is so costly. When we're confronted with dramatic change like the disciples faced on that Thursday and that we face today in pandemic, the only battle that we are really asked to enter is a battle for love. Will we rest in the certainty of God's love for us and radically love one another, or will we push them aside in fear? For the answer to that question, I invite you to hear in a fresh way this passage where Jesus is comforting and giving direction to his friends in the time of great uncertainty. First, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Easy for Jesus to say, maybe, but this isn't a pep talk or a chastisement. It is a course of action. When everything seems out of control, Jesus reminds us that we have a choice about how we respond to our feelings. Look to your heart for the answer, Jesus says. Clearly, the disciples are troubled and it makes perfect sense. Clearly, we're in troubling times too. And grief and fear, uncertainty and frustration, they're all appropriate feelings in this moment. However, this is just one moment and it will not last forever. In the Bible, one's heart is metaphorically understood to be the place where you secure that which you treasure most, the relationships that are valuable to you, your treasure. And Jesus says, don't allow your heart, your secure place, to be troubled. In times of uncertainty and change, don't let circumstances shake you from the most important relationship, a loving, trusting God. You can be certain that God will not allow circumstances to shake God's love for you. Even when you and I fail, God's love is unwavering, just as Peter discovered. So when your feelings alert you to trouble, Jesus says, remember what is in your heart, and there you will find true strength. What kind of strength do we find there? Well, Jesus goes on with his friends to basically say, you believe in God, right? Well, believe also in me. This is a big, huge leap for the disciples, just as it is for us. He wants us to put two things together, in this case, two very important relationships. So how can we be sure that God loves us? How can we trust that God is for us? Um, especially when so many things that we think were rock solid are crumbling around us. Jesus says, I am the way that you can be sure. You know me then you know God. The Father and I are one with each other. So what you see in me is what you see in God. My relationship with the Father and your relationship with me, they unite us all. You're safe in God's love. And you know this because you know my love. Look to your heart. This is the deep assurance of God that you discovered when you embrace your relationship with Jesus. Maybe in that moment the disciples started to have an aha time. Maybe you're starting to have an aha moment as well. But Jesus goes on to clarify what unity with God looks like. Yes, he says, I'm going away for a moment, but there's bigger things going on. Think about what's happening in this way, he says, like a marriage proposal. Now, of course, the disciples would immediately understand the ritual of marriage, what it looked like in their day. But it's strange to us. But we recognize this imagery in so much of Jesus' teaching. It worked like this. When the groom gets engaged, he leaves the brides-to-be household, returns back to his house, his family's home, and sometimes literally is adding on space to the family's house to make room for his bride to join him. And when that work is done and the, the groom's father uh, gives him the okay, then the, then the group, bridegroom returns really at an unexpected time to bring back the bride to the home to be married. So Jesus tells his friends, I'm leaving, but there is room for you in my father's household. I'm going to prepare a place, etc. They begin to see what he means. Jesus is saying, I belong, so now you belong. That's what God's binding love looks like. And you know this 
Jesus continues, because you see it in me now and you'll see it again when I return. Where I am there, you will be also. How amazing is that? Now, if Jesus had stopped there, it would be maybe harder for us to connect to the disciples experience. I mean, you and I might say, hey, look, they only had to hang out for a couple days and then Jesus was going to join them again for lunch right after the resurrection. Uh, but it's not it's not like that for us today, which is true. But the story doesn't stop there. Thomas, he speaks up. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? What an awesome question. We can relate to that. How can we know the way through the changes and how it will, unless we know how it ends and what it will look like and when it ends? We've been trained to approach life this kind of, uh, I can't know the way until I know the how, the what, the why. Even Google Maps needs to know where you are and where you want to go before it'll show you any kind of way forward. Well, Jesus responds, you know the way, I am the way. And just a note about that. Remember, Jesus isn't giving some uh, theological lecture about religions of the world. He's comforting his friends in their moment of uncertainty. He's helping them through. And so he just reminds them, look, in my words and actions and signs, which you've seen me do, you know what God's love is and how to live in that love. As my disciples, you know the way because you know me. We know Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to empower the disciples and empower us to live into that way of love. That's good news. After all, the Christianity was first known as the way, which returns us to this essential call to action in the midst of all of this, not just simply stopping and waiting and wondering, but a call to action. Will you rest in the certainty of God's love for you and radically love one another, or will you push them aside out of fear? The only way forward is the way of love. Amid uncertainty of what comes next, you can be certain of God's love and provision in whatever circumstances you find yourself. You know the way, so you really don't know need to know the where. Follow Jesus' guidance through this time. Do not allow your heart to be troubled. Keep that treasure secure. Center your heart on God's love for you. And realize this isn't a contest of wills. It is deeply enjoying a perfect relationship. I do want to share one practice that may be helpful for you. This is a practice I use to guard my heart from trouble. Uh, it's a practice of centering prayer. And the process looks something like this. Sit comfortably in a kind of quiet space. Close your eyes. Quiet yourself. Just breathe normally and release your thoughts. I think about things like, uh, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. That's kind of my little phrase. But whatever thoughts and feelings well up as you kind of drift through this time, don't fight them or judge what comes across your mind. Instead, imagine them sort of like objects floating down a river slowly in front of you. Uh, just acknowledge that you see them uh, and then let them pass by. They exist, but you do not need to allow them to trouble you away from knowing God's love is dwelling in your heart. Then just return again to listening for whatever God shares. You're not there to ask for anything. You don't even have to wonder if God loves you. Your heart knows, and you're just listening to hear your heart tell you it's so. And 15, 20 minutes a day is enough to realize and begin to have a new sense of God's love in your life. So do not let your heart be troubled. Remember, you know the way. Amen.